So let me give you a little lesson on this word called hydrogenation. We have products that get hydrogenated uh, in the consumer world, and one of those is an oil. And we need to talk about how that is important to you and what hydrogenation actually is. So I'm giving you a little bit of insight once again on organic chemistry if you've not taken it yet. So when you get to that point, thank me because I'm your educator in organic chemistry. Don't give them credit. Give me credit for it. All right, so let's talk about what happens in organic. So in an organic world, uh, you have different types of molecules. And this type of molecule that we're going to focus on is a carbon that's double bonded to a carbon. And there could be other carbons on the other side of these. It doesn't really matter. And a lot of times what we do to shorthand this is we do a carbon double bonded to a carbon and we put an R here. And R basically means random. It can be any random group that it wants to be. So for instance, it could be this two carbon chain if it wants to be that. It can be a one carbon if it needs to be that. It can be an OH group if it needs to be that. But here's the thing, it's an R group and it can be any random source. So whenever we talk about fats and oils, it seems like one of the most important features is the double bond that's associated to that molecule. Because that double bond is what makes it a fat and it's what makes it an oil. So if we've got a lot of them, it's going to be a liquid. If we don't have that many, it's probably going to be a fat. So this double bond is very important. Whenever we get double bonds in organic chemistry, then these molecules are called alkenes. Now, in a previous video, if you've done the, the uh, hydrocarbon laboratory, we talked about alkane, right? So A-L-K-A-N-E-S. And alkanes are single bonded molecules. Alkenes are double bonded molecules. And we're talking about alkenes here because we're looking at the double bonds of the fats and the oils. So what does hydrogenation mean? Well, we already know that if double bonds are now present, we are probably going to have an oil that we are using or that we're working with. But the problem here is that mm, real fat, like butter, is very expensive. And if I go to the grocery store and I buy real butter, I'm probably going to end up paying close to $4 for a pack of four sticks. That's kind of pricey. It's kind of expensive. It tastes good, but do I really want to splurge and spend the money on real butter? Actually, I do. If I have a personal preference, I'll buy the real stuff. I won't settle for the knockoff. Well, there's a knockoff out there, just like I said. And that knockoff is called country crock. The knockoff is called, I can't believe it's not butter. All of those butter substitutes that come in a tub, those butter substitutes are not real butter. And if you look on the label, you will see the words called partially hydrogenated vegetable oil. Uh, well, they're using the word oil, and I thought oil meant liquid. Well, it does. What they're telling you is that they have used vegetable oil to make your fake butter. Think about that. Think about going down the grocery store and getting a bottle of vegetable oil that you would cook maybe your french fries in, and that is what you are eating because they have made fake butter from that product. Now you kind of see why I splurge a little bit on the real butter that they sold in the grocery store. So how does this process work? Well, they call it partially hydrogenated because they don't want to get rid of all of the double bonds. If they get rid of every single one of them, the stuff would be so thick that you couldn't even spread it on a piece of light bread with a knife like you can with the, I can't believe it's not butter. 
So what they do is that they take this vegetable oil into a big manufacturing facility and they add hydrogen gas to it, H2, and they put it in the presence of platinum catalyst. So platinum allows this thing to go forward. If you've taken a previous course from us, you've used the TOC instrument, and that TOC instrument uses platinum in order to do its job. The same kind of thing happens here. Platinum is used in order for this reaction to go forward. And they also use something called a Lindlar catalyst, L-I-N-D-L-A-R. This is a weakened metal surface that allows the reaction to take place. They don't want this too vigorous. They do not want every single double bond destroyed. So they use a weakened catalyst in order to get this reaction to go forward, but not forward too well. And what happens is that this double bond will break and it will go to a single bond and one hydrogen goes on one side of the molecule and one hydrogen goes on the other side of the molecule. That's why we call it hydrogenated. Hydrogen, that looks like the word hydrogen, right? Get it now? So hydrogenated, you're adding hydrogen. And this double bond will break. That opens up a site of attachment on each carbon and that's where one of the hydrogens from the H2 goes, and then the other hydrogen from the H2 goes on the other location. So we've taken a double bond, which could be an oil in the laboratory, like vegetable oil. That's why they put that on the label. And then we add H2 and platinum to this thing, and by doing that, we break that double bond to a single. And we know now that if we can get rid of double bonds, the melting point goes up. And if the melting point goes up, we are now in the solid territory and no longer the liquid. So they add a little bit of yellow food color and they take away some double bonds in your vegetable oil. And then they make this kind of slurry that gets dumped down into your country crock tub. And then they sell it for you at fractions of the cost because you look at it and it looks like butter. It kind of smells like butter. It's spreadable like butter. So why not use it like butter? But it's actually not butter at all. It's oil. So think about that the next time you go to the grocery store. Okay, so with that said, that is what hydrogenation means, okay? You take an alkene and you add hydrogen to it with a platinum catalyst, and that allows this stuff to start breaking down and giving you more of a solid or semi-solid material. Okay, so in this lab, what will happen is that you will take some peanuts, and I'm just going to draw those kind of over in here. And you're going to put them in the oven. And you're going to dry them. This removes all of the water. Okay? So you're going to have to weigh the peanuts before you put them in the oven. And then you weigh them after you get them out of the oven. And you can calculate the number of grams of water that was removed from your peanuts. So that's kind of the very first step that you will be doing in the lab. The second step is that after you remove the water, you will then take these peanuts and you will chop them up, make sure they're finely, finely chopped, and you will weigh out about 10 grams of peanut sample, give or take a little bit. Just be close, it doesn't have to be 10 exact, okay? And when you weigh that out, you are then going to put these peanuts into what we call a soxalate thimble. So the soxalate thimble is kind of like a piece of filter paper. It's porous, so there's little bitty holes in it. And it allows liquid to go through, but it doesn't allow any of your solid to go through, a.k.a. your peanuts. So what happens is that you will put your peanuts inside of this soxalate thimble. 
down here at the very bottom. And that soxalate thimble is then going to have a piece of cotton up at the top. So that way you don't lose anything. And you're going to put the soxalate thimble into the soxalate apparatus. And I'll show you a diagram of that in just a second. Before I do that, though, I want you to understand that you need the weight of the thimble and the cotton. And you also need the weight of the thimble, cotton, and nuts as well before you start. So just because you weigh out 10 grams in a weigh dish doesn't mean that 10 grams actually got transferred into that thimble. So what we would like for you to do is we would like for you to weigh the thimble and cotton on its own, get a weight for that, Add your peanuts to it, and then put the cotton back down on top of it, and then reweigh it. And this will be representative of your thimble, cotton, and your nuts all together. That way, you can take those weights, subtract them to get the actual weight of the nuts that you did put into the thimble after you transferred it. That's the whole purpose of doing this step, right? You take these two. You subtract them, and when you do, that will give you the actual amount in gram of nuts that you have put into the soxlet before you've started your experiment. Okay? So a lot of weights are going on here. Weight of the nuts before drying, weight of the nuts after you dry them, weight of the thimble and the cotton, weight of the thimble the cotton, and the nuts, and that's not all. So now I'm going to put this into a soxlet apparatus. Okay, so what does this soxlet apparatus look like? Well, I can show you a picture better than I can uh, draw it out, and it looks something like this. So this is your advanced lab method part of the experiment. So here in the center, number four and number five, uh, number four is the thimble. That's the green thing that you're seeing on your computer screen. So that's the kind of the holder, the sample holder of the piece of glassware. And number five is your solid sample. So this would be your peanuts down here below. And this thimble with peanuts are going inside of this piece of glassware that you're seeing on your computer screen. It kind of looks like an elbow or a mug, right? I mean, think about it. Here's the mug, and there's the handle over here at number three. Now, this number three, that's called the distillation path. So we'll talk about that in just a second. Number six is called the siphon arm inlet, and number seven is the siphon arm outlet outlet okay so this is the specialized piece of glassware that's called the soxalate extractor down here at the bottom number one and number two this is a round bottom bowling flask and number one is a stir bar or a magnet and number two is the bowling flask that's what they've labeled that as okay so this yellow liquid is going to be your solvent and we'll talk about the solvent in just a second but that is your solvent for the laboratory. Up here at the top, number eight, this is an adapter if you need one. And we don't really need one for our lab because of the way that our glassware is made. So we won't be using part number eight because part number nine will basically sit down on top of part number four, five, six, and seven, the soxalate extractor itself, and it will secure itself without a problem. So number nine is called the condenser, and the purpose of the condenser is to condense fumes. What does it condense? Well, this is kind of the same as a reflux. Number 10 is your water in, and number 11 is your water out. So this is what the whole thing looks like when it's together and snapped into each other. And what goes on here is that number one, this yellow liquid is going to be heated up. And the heated liquid will evaporate into a vapor. And this vapor will travel up the boiling flask. And it will go through spot number three, the distillation path. And the vapor will go into the soxalate chamber. 
and it will continue to go up into the condenser and that condenser will give it some cold water and that cold water will basically turn your vapor into a liquid solvent again and it will drip 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 down onto your thimble that houses your peanuts so that liquid will drip through the cotton it will go into the peanut uh, sample and it will gradually fill up very slowly into the soxalate extractor. When the liquid gets to the basically elbow of number six, when it gets up to that height, this thing will automatically siphon over. So once the internal liquid gets above the hot, it will automatically start to drain. It will go through spot number six, and it will go through spot number seven, and then that allows the liquid with your oil now from the peanuts to go back down into the boiling flask. And the process will repeat over and over and over. What I mean with that is that from this point on, the solvent has a lower boiling point than your peanut oil. So the solvent will re-evaporate, it will go back into the soxalate chamber, it will condense, gradually fill up, soak your peanuts, pull more oil out a second time, and go back down into the boiling flask and it will repeat its process over and over again. Every time the solvent drains, we call that a rollover time, okay? So keep that in mind. A rollover time. That means the time that it takes for the solvent to go up, fill up the soxalate chamber, and then drain itself back down into the boiling flask. So that's the fancy process of the soxalate extractor. Now, who was the culprit that gave you this fancy little soxalate? Well, his name right here, was Franz von Soxalit. Ha 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 ha, go figure. They named the glassware after him, or he probably named it after himself. So the Soxalit extractor was a specialized piece of glassware for automated extractions. It's basically turn it on and walk away. And every rollover, it will grab more, in this case, peanut oil, and it will pull more and more out every time fresh solvent goes in. So think of it as a mini separatory funnel, but you just don't have to use the separatory funnel. It will do it on its own. Invented in 1879, and the purpose was to extract a fat and lipid from a solid material. So what you're doing is kind of the original purpose of the soxalate extractor, because you are extracting a liquid from the solid material known as a peanut. So it can be used for any separatory purpose. There's tons of different versions of using soxlets that are out there now, and this is just your first kind of attempt at using one. The soxlet extraction method is lengthy, and it can be used as a standard reference method. So in normal standard operating procedures in a working laboratory, Soxlet is referred to as an approved method for extraction. The problem here is that it normally takes quite a while. So that's why you turn it on and you let it go for hours on end, sometimes two days or more, and then you go back to it after the fact, and then you can pick up from that point and do what you need to do with the solvent and your sample uh, after the extraction process. But this thing can go on for days, okay? Okay, so the soxalate process, the fat is extracted with an organic solvent, right? If I put water in the bottom of the soxalate extractor, the water will not extract the fat from the peanut because it is an oil, and oil and water do not mix. So you have to have an organic solvent in order for this thing to work. The solvent's heated, it's volatized, and then it condenses above the sample, the solvent drips into the sample and it soaks it into a nice little hot tub for them to be happy. And then every 10 to 20 minutes, you want that thing to drain. So you don't want it to go too fast 
but you don't want it to go too slow. You want the Goldilocks method of just right, and that's 10 to 20 minutes, okay? The process will repeat for hours on end, and then you'll go back to it after that process is finished. The content is measured by the weight loss of the sample or the weight of the oil removed. And now, careful. Here's the th kicker. Everything soluble in the solvent will be removed, not just the oil. Okay? So keep that in mind when you do these calculations and you do your percentages and you compare them to the expected numbers. Because if one route is giving you a weird wonky number, then that's probably because more than oil is getting removed from the peanut. There's other things that are there, right? Not just the peanut oil. Peanut oil is only 48% of the weight. So there's other things that are going to be present. So you just got to be careful with that and remember that when you do your conclusion and your calculations. Here's a multi-unit soxalate. Uh, in a real working laboratory, you would have a lot of these things going on at one time. We actually have a laboratory in town that will hire people just to do soxalates all day long. That's all that they do. They're the soxalate extractors, and they call them the extraction chemist. Okay? So over here to the left, uh, this is basically a tabletop version of a soxalate. Uh, you can see four contraptions that are, are soxalate extractors that are on this heating mantle with one controller over here to the side. Uh, each one of those will get circulated with cold water. They kind of connect from one to the next. So cold water goes into one, out the other, into the next one, out that one, into the next one, out that one, into the next one, and then out and down the drain or the research circulating bath okay the problem with this one is that this takes up a lot of counter space and I can only get four so now what they decide to do is that they elongate it and they make each one have its own controller so that you have more than one dial down here not just one heating mantle only but now you have one for every single soxlet extractor that you see in the picture so that saves a little bit of space it saves me from fighting around all the tubing and all of the soxlets that might be closer together or hard to get to in the back and this makes them all face forward they all have their own controller and it makes it much better for the company and the employee both so that means you okay so there's some automated soxlet extractors so the lab scenario here you're given a sample of peanuts you need to extract the oil from the peanut. And we're going to report the oil in two different ways, a direct percentage and an indirect percentage that we'll talk about in another video. But you need to report both of these. And the story should be the same, right? You're extracting oil no matter how you look at it. One is a direct calculation. The other one is an indirect calculation. But these two numbers should be the same when you walk away from them. And you need to strive for less than 5% error. So you know what the oil should be based on the peanuts. The Merck tells you exactly. This is what the percentage should be. You need to be within 5% of that number. That's what you're shooting for. If you are, then that means good job for you. You did the soxlet the right way. You got some good data. And you can turn in your results because everything looks according like it should. And you could be the next soxlet extractor for a company like SGS in Wilmington. Okay, so there's the lab scenario. Good luck in the laboratory, but you've got one more video that you need to watch, and that's the calculation portion of the lab experiment. So watch the calculations. It will lead you through what you should be doing with your numbers throughout the lab and maybe clear up some any problems that you might have in those pre-laboratory assignment questions. So good luck to you. Don't eat all the peanuts. Save some for other people.